From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. Once again, I'm Chelsea Judge, Scientific Advisor with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Today on the pod, we are going to be joined by the Sumire Foundation for NMO Ambassadors, Alexis Martha of New Jersey, Kristen Hewitt of Texas, and Julie Aldridge of West Virginia. So honored and delighted to have these three amazing women on the pod. Alexis is currently a senior in college planning for her post-grad studies. Julie is a mother and an NMO warrior and an all-around amazing advocate. And Kristen is also balancing career with motherhood and also being a patient ambassador. So we're really excited to have these women on and we're going to talk about interpersonal relationships with NMO. So that means what's it like balancing friendships, um, close partnerships, marriage, coworkers, close friends and family, all of that, as you can see, probably a lot of nuance and unique uh, roles of NMO in all of these relationships. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, excited for this opportunity. I do not have NMO. I am I'm very privileged, uh, you know, health-wise, personally. My brother who lives with NMO, my husband with MS, and I do see how MS and NMO respectively impact their lives and their relationships. One of the things that my husband Austin says a lot is just, you really know who your true like family and friends are. And I, I like, obviously, you know, you're born with your family, but your chosen family, so to speak, which could be the people you're born with that you keep and also the people that you add on and how Austin really like gives weight to his, his support system, his close friends and family um, who have helped get him through with MS. And I just think that that support system is powerful, but you you only get there after kind of um, really learning the true friendships and that, that comes from sometimes weeding out the not true friendships. What, how do you guys feel about that? I agree with that. I think that there's definitely been, um, there's friends that step up and are there to help. Um, I also think that there's a lot of connections made through the community itself, you know, just kind of meeting other people that have either similar disorders um, or they also have NMO and you kind of connect with them through the cats and the support groups and things like that. So you're building relationships with people that understand what you're going through. You know, my family and my friends are great, but they don't understand things the same way that maybe the NMO community mm-hmm. does. Mm-hmm. So it plays a role in kind of how you build those relationships with people once you've been diagnosed as well. One of my best friends is a nurse, and um, she has been there every step of the way with me. And she seems to actually get it. And she's actually even the one there that she's a pediatric um, oncology nurse. So she sees some bad stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And she's actually been there at times and just said, okay, get out of it. That's enough. Move on. You've had your moment, you know? And things like that actually help, I think. For me, thank mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. For me personally, I you know it's about having time and giving space. Like feel your feelings, but then have people kind of help to ground you so that you don't get stuck in them. Yeah. It's really hard. Like when my experience, just like with with Connor Bean, I think so many people just. I don't think fully understand that the chronic nature of it, right? And like, you know, your friend who's a nurse and has actually treated a lot of patients. I think a lot of people can't grasp that like this is this is an indefinite thing rather than like you just want an answer of like, oh, how are they doing? Oh, they're okay. They're fine. It's all gone now. You know what I mean? I think there's a lot of that that people don't fully grasp. Oh, I completely understand that. Yeah, I have friends who don't understand that if they call me, you know, maybe an hour before they want to be somewhere and if I'm in the middle of not necessarily a flare but there are times where you just don't feel well Mm -hmm. I can't just jump up and go you know it's just it's not something that I can do I wish it was and yes I used to be able to but I can't do that now they do not understand that like that it's just too much for me and then they it's almost like they give me a hard time. Yeah, because they, yeah, I think so. Um, Because they maybe, it's like the peer pressuring you to come join us is is a well-intentioned place. Like, they love you. They want to be around you. They want to do things with you. But they don't realize, like, that there's literally a pathological fatigue aspect of NMO chronic illness uh, 
And then there's like the indirect, right? Of just like, it's, it's tiring. You have a lot of things on your plate in addition to your other roles in life. Exhausting. And I can't run and jump and meet them and come home and take care of my children. Mm-hmm, and they mm-hmm. have my party. So you have to save you have in the tank for what you have at home too. I don't know if you guys like spoon theory, right? Like there's a good tool to explain to people that me as an otherwise healthy person, like I have an indefinite amount of spoons, but like my husband, Connor, right? Because of their MS and NMO, they don't have, they have a finite number of spoons and they need to be cautious or conscious of how they're using them. And it's not, it's, it's not on others to just like be born with that knowledge. You know, it is about like education and understanding, but it can definitely, I think, impact friendships and close family relationships. It's such a rare disease. I mean, my doctor, when I was diagnosed, he has two patients with it. I'm one of two. So I mean, Mm. people just don't understand and you can't expect them to either. And it's, it's so rare that it's hard to explain even. I mean, there's so many different dimensions to it that it's just hard to even explain to them. I was just going to say, I think like the invisible aspect of it is also really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, I know myself, I have been really fortunate that I don't have necessarily any visible long lasting impacts from NMO. So when people see me, they think like, oh, like she's fine. Mm -hmm. Like an average college girl. I know that there's been instance, instances at school where I, uh, someone came in with the flu to a rehearsal. I'm heavily involved in theater. And I said, do you mind, like, please wearing a mask? Like, I'm wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask. And this was, like, before masks were, like, you know, a cool thing to do, you know? <laughs> um, but I said, like, can you wear a mask? I'm going to wear a mask. Like, it would just, like, for me, if I get the flu, it's not just getting the flu. It's risk of relapse. It's, like, right, possibly right. in the hospital. And they were like, yes, of course, no problem. I turn around, they took off their mask. Uh, and it was like, I thought you were a friend. I thought that like you cared about me, but like clearly you think that I'm just like making this up. It's just, it's, it can be really hard to explain to people because they think that you're fine, but you're really not. No, I think that's a really good point. My husband and I were just talking about this. It's like he he's legally blind but from his ms but you would never know like right like he can make eye contact like you know you would never know he looks like he's an otherwise very healthy man he's like in some aspects grateful right that it's invisible because he doesn't want to be fully defined by his ms or his blindness but then people won't give him grace for it right like they don't know and so they don't know to be accommodating or extra considerate and and then that sucks, right? So it's it's this weird thing of like, you want to be seen. I think it's just that people want to be respected, right? And you don't, we don't want to bite anybody just because they don't know, because why would they know? But like once they're educated and they're, they are aware, it's, can you just please be considerate and understand? Yeah, I've always described it to like my friends and family as that, like that in between of feeling like too, I'm too well to be sick and mm-hmm. I'm too sick well Mm. and it's that constant balance of like trying to like have people understand that and know that you're just like you yourself are aware that you're in this gray area Mm -hmm. um you're asking for like the space and grace to like understand that and then these are like we're talking about family and friends which you know they're probably going to be the people who are most willing to to really try to understand but that can obviously be very turbulent uh but those are the people who who stick around, who love you, who will figure it out with you, even though it's messy. But what about like in other aspects of dating? So I was 18 when I was diagnosed, which is like peak of hookup culture. (laughs) Um, I was diagnosed like my freshman year of college, my first semester, right when like everyone is like, you know, experimenting and like going full force. Like I want, you know, no strings attached. And when I got sick, it was kind of like this whole like, oh my gosh, hookup culture is so different now Mm -hmm. Uh, because I was paralyzed waist down. Mm. And no one, like, I mean, no one really talks to you about like how to have that conversation of like, oh, am am I going to be able to have sex? Like no no one talks to you about that. You have to figure that out for yourself. So it was just very weird for me because it just, it turned my young youthful like oh I'm just gonna have fun to oh now every guy or, or person that I talk to it has to be oh well I have this disease it's gonna affect this in this way mm-hmm. oh by the way I have to get chemo infusions so it's gonna make me very susceptible to these types of infections and it's just like this weighted conversation 
so for me when I got back to school it was just it changed the game because as soon as you brought that up you knew who actually wanted to spend time with you yeah. versus who was like looking for like something like quick mm-hmm. but I, w- I was really lucky that I um I had a friend and we had met up and I just had a, this moment where I just like unleashed everything. I was like, I'm frustrated. I'm sad. I just want to have like a normal dating life. And now we've been dating now for years. You can have these like very intense upfront conversations and it's very, very difficult and awkward. But I, I like how you told your experience, Lexi, but like you find that people who like the Dr. Seuss quote, the people who uh, mind don't matter and the people who matter don't mind that kind of thing. That so I met my boyfriend. Um, I lost my vision in 2014, but I wasn't diagnosed until 2017. So he met me. I was in between jobs. I had I couldn't see. I really wasn't driving much, so I'd actually quit my job. And he claims I almost ran him over in my grandmother's <laughs> drive. It <laughs> the the lack of vision because it was slowly starting to come back at that point. And he'll also make jokes that like I I decided to stick with him because I couldn't see him. And so kind of. And, you know, he was, from the very beginning, even before diagnosis, as I was kind of navigating everything, he was making light of it, and he was making jokes, and he has stuck around, um, so we've been together since 2014, mm-hmm. um, so he was with my diagnosis, he's been with me through all of my attacks, he kind of became that stabilizing factor for me, because, you know, sometimes I'm overdoing it, or I don't want to slow mm-hmm, down, and mm-hmm. very much that that patience for me and saying, hey, you've got to slow down a little bit. You you know, maybe we should do this. But I think we've also had to have some really difficult conversations after my diagnosis. You know, having conversations about like, do we want to have kids that look like being on Rituxin or being on NMO or having NMO. But I have a nine-year-old son and at the time, my diagnosis was kind of set from that loss of vision in 2014, but we've more recently figured out, I was telling my neurologist, I had hyperemesis during my pregnancy, I had narcoleptic episodes after my pregnancy, and she's like, those might have been an MO. And so now there's kind of this thought about, you know, do we do we want to forward with having children and, you know, what does our future look like and what is that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how does it impact that? And so, Thankfully, I didn't have to go through the traditional dating with an MO, but now kind of being in that relationship and having those conversations about what does the future really look like for us, that's probably been the biggest impact for us with an MO um, is just kind of that, that, do we have kids or even just buying a house? Yeah. You know, we, we were for a house two years ago and he was very adamant that I needed to have a one-story house because in February of 2018, I started kind of losing um, functionality in my right leg. And I bought a house in October of 18. And he's like, what if you can't get up those stairs? Because I was stubborn. I bought a house with stairs. Um, but those types of things that you have to think about. Mm-hmm. He, again, he's my sanity. He's the one asking the questions while I'm over here. Like, I am perfectly normal and healthy and I can do what I want to do. Um, it, it's your advocate. Like, he, you know, no one wants to admit that they that they might need like extra accommodation or like, you know, that things might need to look different. But if you have like someone in your corner watching you, they can do that for you. That's a me. That's a great partner. Yeah. He's been amazing. <laughs> All of these stories are the positive stories. And I feel like the key um, overlaps that I hear is like very strong, intense communication, being honest, being direct, talking about needs and shared experiences and, and mutual understanding. But if you look at the statistics of relationships, marriages, like the divorce rate, you know, I'm I'm basically extrapolating from a lot with from MS just because, right, there's more data there. Like the divorce rates are much higher in marriages in people with MS compared to the general population, which, of course, is already quite high. And I know that can be actually... uh, even higher when it's the woman who is living with MS versus, you know, if it's a man living with MS and like the the partner is a male, right? And, you know, we can go into a lot of speculation on the dynamics of that. Um, But, right, we're all, you know, seemingly, you know, women with male partners, but, and it's, and these are great success stories, but it seems like it's because you guys are doing all of this very upfront work, which of course is required in any relationship, but NMO just like amplifies, like you don't have a choice, but to immediately have these like um, very difficult, but very impactful conversations. Well, 
a blessing in meeting him before my diagnosis and being able to have, or at least when I was having symptoms, mm-hmm. because he got decision up front. You know, sometimes I think about, you know, what if I had been in my prior relationship and had been diagnosed? I don't think that relationship would have survived. Mm. Like, I think that he really got to make the choice to stick around. Um, and he also kind of got to experience things with it not being a marriage and having to I think you get into a marriage and you kind of have a routine you have expectations about how that marriage is going to go and then a diagnosis thrown in the middle of that can change that dynamic of what you thought that relationship was yeah whereas when you've got relationship you're setting those expectations from the beginning and so I think that was kind of our blessing was we got to have those conversations up front rather than being six years or more into a relationship and then all of a sudden having this you know this diagnosis come up and change that dynamic that we had we'd established and worked for yeah wow Kristen that's I think an incredibly insightful Julie you're you are a married woman with NMO and we briefly talked about this before that you have like this very wonderful supportive husband yeah, how did you guys do that? Well, I think it's been about five years ago when I was diagnosed, and he has been there since every step of the way. Um, my original diagnosis was MS, which happens to a lot of NMO patients. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> coincidentally, my husband is a pharmaceutical sales rep who has been selling multiple sclerosis drugs for about 20 years now. Wow. So the whole time he was like, mm, "It's I don't think it's MS, Julie. I just don't think it is. And so he... <laughs> he researched, he did all of these incredible things. I was just ready to just accept it, move on, be done with it. I, I too was stubborn. Okay, so it's MS. I'm going to beat this. Who cares? We don't need to do more. You know, and then um, because mine started with loss of vision also, but he insisted that they check for bands, even though that's not 100%, you know, positive, mm-hmm. but there were no mm-hmm. bands. Um. He just did all, and so all of that. He knew, hmm, most MS patients have illegal clonal bands, like that, that autoantibody clump, right. basically. Um, and he's like, hmm, if overwhelmingly most patients have this, and she's having these like yeah. weird visual, wow, like amazing. And just like Kristen, I had weird things during my pregnancy. I've had all kinds of autoimmune issues throughout my life. And if you look back on it, it's all... It all seems like, oh, well, that was probably an MO mm-hmm, at this point. We'll mm-hmm. learn. So he is just incredible. And we have been able to have every conversation that we've needed to have about this. And he's he's actually pushed me to do more and, and try more. And just recently, it's odd that we're having this conversation now because um, our electricity has been out a lot with the snowstorm recently mm-hmm. where I live. That we've kind of been forced <laughs> into a bedroom um, <laughs> and we've been able to just talk and it's Mm -hmm. we've talked about the future we've talked about everything I've cried and he's like you're it's fine it's going to be fine because we don't know what the future holds no one knows right I mean even a person has no idea what the future holds so he's able to kind of turn my perspective and make me understand it's it's going to be okay he's there every step of the way he's he's an amazing support system and the knowledge that he has from his background has been incredibly helpful that's an incredibly wonderful story and i would love to meet him because he sounds like he's a great partner with covid which obviously lots of difficulties but one of the silver linings i think and my husband and i joke is that like oh, we know that we love each other now, right? Like we've been stuck alone pretty much for a year having these intense conversations on top of intense conversations (laughs) about who we are and what we want because we have nothing else to do. And I feel like we've been married, we've been married for like a year, but I feel like we've been actually with the pandemic conversion rate. We've been married for like 12 years and you know, we're going strong. (laughs) Thank you for sharing all of that, Julie, though. Like that it's, you guys are defying the odds and it to me it, it seems like and i think that there's data to support this that it's you guys are having these open raw honest um conversations your so, like solid communication and like he just definitely obviously um understands the situation probably better than like most people ever would if we couldn't communicate openly it would never it would never work again like Kristen said if you can't the fact that 
they can have those conversations up front is amazing. I mean, if, cause if, if you can't communicate it, you will not make it through this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was to say, especially with COVID on top of the disease. Yeah. And I think like I'm also hearing is in a lot of ways you have to find a partner who will help advocate for you when you're too t- like when you're too tired or like you're going through a relapse or you're the one like you're the patient like you're trying to just like be healthy and overcome this like you you do need a partner to rally for you um but of of course you know that doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic partner you know that could be a family member a really good friend like neighbor whatever but you definitely have to have one and if you're gonna have um a partner in life that the law you know calls your spouse then they really better be an advocate for you absolutely kind of now shifting How do you manage, how do you manage relationships where you're not very close with them? And we were talking about like, you know, having advocates for you, but what happens when you have to become your own advocate um, and managing relationships with coworkers, classmates, uh, professors, things like that? I think for me, for, um, so during like my flare that wound up getting me diagnosed, I was actually in my, like the biggest project of my career at the time. And we were on a go live weekend. And so I worked from the infusion center, I'm hooked up to steroids on my computer, um, kind of facilitating this go live. And then Monday morning, I still had the IV port in my arm, was like leaving work early to go get steroids. Wow. Um, so I'm running around it, supporting everybody that was, it was a software rollout. So kind of running around the office with an IV literally hanging out of my arm that Monday. Mm. And so I kind of went, first into being open with my employer about being sick and about having, you know, something going on. Um, And so I've been really lucky in that case because I think that um, they're extremely understanding. My boss at the time has was always, you know, if I needed time off or, you know, I've come in, I tend to have steroid withdrawals. And so there have been times where maybe I had steroids over the weekend and I come in on Monday and I'm like swelling up like a gigantic balloon. I'm sweating, I'm broke, you know. And so, you know, they're like, go home. Like, you know, they're very supportive. Um, But I think the other side of it is, is that I also don't want to have people think I'm not capable of doing my Uh job because uh of it. So there's this balance of being open and communicating with my coworkers. You know, the ones that sit around me, I'm like, hey guys, like if I stand up and I collapse on the floor, like this is who you call, um, versus sitting in a meeting and using it as an excuse and saying, well, I didn't do this because I'm sick. Right. And it's just kind of learning that balance of being open and sharing that so that my, you know, kind of my people at work understand what's going on, but then also proving I'm capable of and I can I can do my job and be successful with it. And, and right, like, wow, what a tough balance to strike, by the way, right, that you're trying to overcome basically like a stereotype that people with a chronic illness might not be able to do their job or take or use it as an excuse um, for underperforming when really you're just asking for, I mean, understanding and compassion. But but, you know, that is a that is a balance that has to be met. How often do you find or do you find at all like any issues with like ableism? Um, so thankfully I'm kind of like Alexis where visually, unless I've told you that I'm sick or maybe you were one of those people that saw me running around like the crazy person with my IV in the arm, <laughs> um, you really, um, I do have some bit and issues related to, um, light sensitivity and stuff like that. So like I have to have my desk set up just the right way with the lighting and stuff like that. But so far, I think because people can't visually see it, mm-hmm. um, I guess. I don't experience a lot of um, ableism or anything like that. Um, every now and then we'll have something like we, you know, maybe if we're doing a move or something, I tend to notice people are a little bit more like, can I help you? Can I lift those boxes for you? Can I, you know, and I'm the suburb, like I'm, I'm capable of doing it myself. I can, you know, yeah. I can move it and regret that because sometimes maybe I could. But I think that's really, and I, I don't necessarily um, interpret that as ableism. I, I think I see it more as them supporting me. I really and truly, you know, sometimes they hear the stories of others with NMO and, you know, what their experiences have been like. And I just, I really, I recognize that I've been very blessed 
in that regard with having an employer that is so supportive and you know people that I work with co-workers that have become friends through this process and you know I know that they're there for me um so definitely I know that I probably had a different journey than some with their employer just because I have been so blessed with with how things turned out and I'm so glad that you have been so blessed and I and I you know I would think like more and more like that will be the standard or the norm of like social behavior but thank goodness for it yeah I think Kristen said something that really resonated with me where, you know, you you want people to know about and your like disability. You want people to know that, but you also don't want them to think that you're not capable. Mm-hmm. Um, I, f- I find that as a woman, I'm always struggling with like my imposter syndrome. Yes. Like, did I, really, did I really do this like well? Did I? And then when you add like having NMO and having a disability on top of that, at least in school, when I like, you know, have to get my accommodations form signed, And then I start doing really well on like exams and papers. I'm like, did I really do that well? Or like, do they just kind of feel bad for me and are like, you know, grading like like extra nice? Um, So I I totally resonate with that. And Lexi, did you feel like, you know, throughout school, did you, so you've had like mostly good experiences with accommodations or has there ever been a moment that, you know, it was maybe a little bit more tenuous or a fight? Yeah, so it was, uh, Freshman through junior year, smooth sailing, got my accommodations form signed, everything was, you know, hunky dory. And then first semester of my senior year, um, I decided to take a nutrition class. Um, I'm so exciting news. I actually haven't told my family this yet, but by the time the pro- uh, this airs, they'll know. Um, but I was accepted to Johns Hopkins for my graduate studies. I'll be studying nutrition, um, and I want to ultimately do research on how nutrition impacts like NMO flares and attacks. Lexi, congratulations um, and good for you. That is incredible. <laughs> I've, you're amazing. Wahoo! I'm applauding you. Thank you. Um, so you know when i signed up for this class like obviously it was like very important to me like it's not just like a throwaway class like it's what i'm basing the future off of so i had sent my accommodations form i think like the second week of classes to my professor and i received an email back saying if you had read my syllabus you would know that i only accept accommodations forms the first week otherwise you are not getting accommodated please call my office hours and that just really took me aback I was like whoa I'm like first of all like you need to have grace for people who are just like adjusting to the semester secondly like what the heck like what if I was diagnosed midway through the semester would you just like not accommodate yeah that's a very heated email to get yeah yeah so I went to this office hours with her and I like explained like you know, I might be fine right now, but like three months from now, especially during a pandemic, like, I don't know if I'm going to get COVID. I don't know if I'm going to react to that. Like, I don't know. Right. I just, I need the ability to like, for an extension, like if possible, um, not even if possible, just like, you know, I'm not going to be, I need to prioritize. I need the ability to prioritize my health. Right. And her response was, well, you can just do it from your bed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm seeing this. Wow. Um, so that was not great. I had uh, the Accessibility Resource Center got involved. It didn't really help. We ended up having this. This went on for months. It just always circled back to, um, well, the class is asynchronous, so you should have enough time to like complete the stuff even if you are sick. And I was like, that's not really how this works. Um, and then the idea was, oh, well, if you don't if you um if you can't finish the coursework now you can just pick up where you left off next semester i said okay and if i get sick next semester are you going to make me not go to grad school and make me spend an extra semester and during my undergrad just because you won't accommodate me yeah this is becoming also more like a a principle of the matter kind of thing exactly and it became like like you said like a fight of principles and it also just became like it felt like it was a power play Mm -hmm. like she wanted to assert her dominance and say like no like i'm right so eventually um it didn't get anywhere i never got my accommodations uh, signed like that really stunk um but i during that class i was also taking um, a policy course a public health policy course and our final project was to find a policy um and work on it like come up with solutions to make it better Mm -hmm. so i picked the ada 
and I analyzed like, okay, you know, the wording in the ADA for accommodations is so vague. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't really provide any expectations for college students. It's more so focused on workplace. Um, And that's a huge gap because, you know, there's specific policy for K through 12 and then there's specific policy for workplace, but that in between of like 18 to 21, like there's nothing. Um, And so people like my professor can read into that and, you know, make it how they want it to be so that they don't have to, you know, help people really that's what it comes down they don't have to accommodate yeah and um so i wrote this paper and one of my solutions was having ada training for uh professors and students at the school and i was uh, at the end of my paper i was like you know what like this is like it it wouldn't it wouldn't cost the school anything um and like you know it it um, was correlated to like increased mental health, like increased relationships, better grades, um, better standings for the school. Like I, I really went in depth with this and I presented it actually to the president of the school. Um, I'm lucky that she's like super open to hearing and I've talked with her about like disability advocacy before. And she's like, this is a great idea. I want you to work with the accommodations office, like the disability office, and I want you to implement this. Go girl. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. So this semester, which is cool, it's like my senior year, it kind of feels like my legacy, my last semester, and I'm working on this training that's going to be implemented in the fall. So all incoming students, faculty, and staff are going to, you know, have to actually sit down and think about what it means to, you know, be able-bodied versus being disabled. And I'm just, I'm really excited about Look it. Look at so, you implementing you know, evidence-based great. policies. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, so... I'm, I'm excited because, you know, it was a really, really crappy situation. And I think that you can either let that get to you and you can just kind of like wallow in that. But I think that, you know, having NMO really teaches you, you have to be strong and you have to fight for yourself, whether it be for your health or just like in general, like you, you're, we're all fighters. Yes. And um, I think what you're doing is obviously amazing. You're being an advocate, not only for yourself, but for others. Um, you're advocating from your experience so that other people don't have to go through it or and probably worse, right? Yeah, Definitely. Oh, I, that's you guys are all so impressive. Like I'm sitting here reflecting that like we have all of you go like battling an MO every day, and what that looks like is you all highlighted so much, so many degrees of uncertainty, and how it it creates added layers of complexities for like your whole life, including your relationships, and yet that you're successful with what you do, like with your marriage and with your with your motherhood, um, with your careers, with your schoolwork, just just wow and thank you so much for sharing your experiences and also in addition to everything that you do being advocates for the NMO community. Mm